Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for this Grattan webinar event, Schooling in the Time of COVID. I'm Jordana Hunter, the Director of the School Education Program at the Grattan Institute. I'm joining you this afternoon from the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to the elders of all of the lands around the country from which people are joining today. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about the challenges facing schools and children in Australia as we transition to the next phase of living with COVID-19. We're very lucky today to be joined by a number of experts who can talk us through the health and educational dimensions of the challenge and hopefully share some lessons from other countries that are a little bit further along than us. We're particularly fortunate that our discussion will be moderated by Henry Grossick, the current and founding principal of Berwick Lodge Primary School in Melbourne's East. Henry has more than 30 years experience in school leadership and also hosts the popular radio and podcast show, Viewpoints, which some of you may listen to regularly. I'm really excited to have a principal moderating the panel who's able to bring a real life perspective to the realities of what the pandemic means for children and teachers on the ground. And I know it's a very busy time for, for you, Henry, so we're very grateful to have you with us today. After the panel discussion, we'll be answering questions from the audience. So please keep those questions coming through the chat feature. I'm going to hand over now to Henry to kick us off. Thank you, Jordana. And uh, I'd like to firstly congratulate the Grattan Institute and yourself for putting this uh, forum together. It's a very timely, very important, and we're all um, looking for, for reassurance, knowledge, and uh, hope in moving forward. And I'm sure that with the panel that uh, we have here today and their expertise and experience and wisdom, uh, we'll be able to leave this meeting feeling uh, somewhat comfortable um, in a time when we're not particularly comfortable and have some, some uh, answers to some of the challenges that uh, face us. Uh, our panel, and it's a great panel, Suji Shin, who's the Deputy Executive Director, California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, CCE. Welcome, uh, Suji. And we have Sharon Goldfeld, a paediatrician, Royal Children's Hospital Centre for Community Child Health and Theme Director for Population Health, Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And of course, Jordana Hunter, who's the Education Program Director at the Grattan Institute. And I think uh, when you look at that, uh, that uh, group of people, we've got international expertise and uh, uh, some uh, experience that's ahead of us here in Australia on which we can, can draw and lean. We also have, and the well-being of children is so important. Uh, and as we've seen in this pandemic, that's caught us unawares at times. Uh, and of course, Jordana Hunter, who's an expert in educational research and brings that perspective uh, to the panel. So once again, uh, congratulations to the Grattan Institute and to our speakers who are here today. We're going to do this in, in several parts. We're going to start by looking back into the present and then later on, we're going to look forward. So we cover all bases. I'll start with a question firstly to uh, Suji. Uh, Suji, welcome from uh, the USA and it's good to see you're still bright and alert. It must be evening time over there. Thrilled to be here though. Absolutely, absolutely. Suji, how have schools and children been affected by COVID overseas? Uh, your perspective uh, from California, learning disruption, health, welfare impacts, etc. Yeah, you know, I think um, we're in a space where we were in lockdown for um, about the first six month pandemic starting in March of last year, and where all of our schools across the state, you know, really across the country, went offline and we're really uh, focusing on transitioning to the virtual learning space. After that, um, over the holidays last year, you know, we started to see schools and districts coming back online um, or coming back in person and doing a little bit of that hybrid learning through the, um, through the end of the 1920 school year. Now, starting this year, many of our schools started off in that hybrid learning space where they were again partially online or in person um, to a space where now most of our schools in California are in person um, full time. 
Um, that said, you know, what we're navigating now, um, as many of you are all facing to, and I think Henry, you were talking about in your own school, is we're facing the situation where we now are really having to navigate the quick turnarounds of closing, reopening schools as cases, um, you know, pop up inside of our school communities, thinking through what are quarantining policies, um, navigating all of those health risks to ensure that our students remain, you know, safe. Um, that our staff are cared for while we really focus on learning. Um, that said, you know, I think what we're finding right now is that so much of our administrative time for our school and district leaders are now shifted away from the space of focusing on teaching and learning that the way that they have in the past, the way they should be right now, especially as we're trying to address some of these um, needs around learning loss that our students have faced um, across the state and country and across our schools, and instead having to focus on things like contact tracing, um, you know, uh, really thinking through navigating some of our, you know, safety protocols. And so that's a space that we find ourselves in right now, really thinking through how do we maintain, again, a safe, environment, both physically as well as kind of emotionally, mentally, and address those needs while still really focusing on the key task at hand for us at schools, right, which is the teaching and learning for students. Um, one of the things that we're now hitting is, for some people, is a bit of a brick wall because this has turned out to be a longer marathon than we thought, and we probably predicted slightly different conditions in our schools uh, in pivoting into if you like, uh, what, let's hope it's the home straight, uh, metaphorically speaking. Um, what, what advice can you give us on this point when people are getting tired and they're probably not expecting to be in the place, the space that we are? Yeah. No, I think um, I'd say one of the biggest lessons learned from our work is really focusing on the communication that we need. You know, within that school community, our um, our parents and our school leaders are that frontline point of contact for, you know, between medical staff, between the county, between the administrative staff and our students and parents, and really ensuring that we keep that line open. I think where we've seen the most positive results in terms of students coming back on, the feeling of kind of um, community safety, the really ability and the support from this you know, wider school community on the decisions that the school and the district teams are making are those places where parents feel included in the conversation. They're clear on what the decisions have been made. They're understanding the whys behind any of the individual um, you know, decisions, safety protocols that are made, you know, regardless of you know, uh, I'm sure you know if you're hearing of the news in the U.S. at all, you know, a lot of this is very politicized for us. So, you know, everything from our masking mandates to, you know, sort of how um, what uh, quarantining looks like and these protocols that we're taking. But really, you know, the opportunities that we're taking and building to ensuring that there are those lines of communication, that people feel heard, that there are opportunities to really understand the decisions that are being made in light of the safety needs for our students and our staff, right? I think it's not just one or the other, that this is part of a community decision that we're making um, have really helped ensure that we're taking the steps, you know, collaboratively. Mm, good point. Taking that point a little further, Sharon, um, from your perspective, what do we know about the impact of COVID on children? Uh, looking at it from the health and mental health uh, lockdown aspects here in Australia. Yeah, so it's been very interesting. So, you know, up until uh, Delta, there was almost zero in direct impact of COVID um, on children. And really, um, and now we see a lot more emerging mental health impact. And um, we, we've been doing a bit of um, research at the um, Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Where we've been kind of following up cohorts. So we get this kind of uh, cool ability to be able to see what these kids look like beforehand and then what they look like. Um, during COVID. And we're definitely seeing um, actually the most amount of stress and mental health stress we're seeing is in the parents, to be 100% honest. And I do think we need to be aware of that because it's, it's, most of these surveys are actually, and studies are actually getting the report um, of the parents on themselves and of the parents on their children. So it is very um, subjective in that way. And so I use a real big shout out to parents because I think parents are actually doing it quite tough. You know, up to the point where we saw in um, 
and uh, we had the RCH, Royal Children's Hospital National Poll. So it is a national survey. And about 60% of parents in Victoria and New South Wales, so this is September um, this year, and you know that both states were in lockdown at that time, 60% of parents were feeling a form of mental health distress. So, it, you know, um, virtual learning and everything else that goes along with it does have a lot of stress on parents. So I, I think we're seeing definitely mental health impacts on children, but a lot of that is around mental health impacts on parents. We're definitely seeing more mental health presentations to emergency departments, and that's worrying for all of us. And we're particularly seeing that around self-harm and um, eating disorders. That is actually a worldwide phenomenon, interestingly enough, mm. um, around increasing eating disorders. So we do have this kind of um, pointy, what I would call the pointy end of mental health problems of concern. But there's also a kind of general feeling, Henry, to be honest, that once kids are back in school, back into that routine, a lot of the mental health distress, I would say, rather than mental health problems, will, will start to melt away because kids will be back into those sorts of routines. Mm. Now, the thing that is flying on top of all of this is that Delta has changed things a bit in regard to children and COVID. So when we had Alpha, and in particular in Australia, of course, which is kind of different to the US, we had zero COVID here, essentially. Mm. Whereas from the get-go, the US have been having to deal with you know, there's no zero COVID policy in the US. <laughs> they missed that one. Um, so, so we've now moved, I think, from this kind of um, zero COVID um, sort of, I guess, um, opportunity we had, and then which was fantastic. I think it protected a lot of people for a long time. And now we're kind of moving into this living with COVID um, paradigm, which I think is taking everyone a bit of time to get used to. But part of that uh, is that more children um, have and will have COVID. And so now we've moved from kids not having it and now we've got kids having it. The amazing thing is that kids are actually quite well. And this is just, I can't even explain how extraordinary it is that a respiratory virus, virus like this is so kind to children. Um, many, many respiratory yeah. viruses are not so kind to children. And in fact, we have another virus in our community called respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, that is really unkind to very young children. And in fact, we've had more hospitalizations of that in the past 12 months than any COVID hospitalization. So it's really reassuring, I think. It should be reassuring for parents that kids are quite well, but we are seeing it more. So on top of all the mental health concerns parents have, now they've got concerns, quite rightly, well, what does that mean for my child, particularly for children who are under the age of vaccination? So I think we've got these conflated parents are holding, um, you know, these kind of different anxieties. I know my kid needs to go back to school because I can see they're not doing so well at home and I know they'll be better off at school. Hang on, but I'm a bit worried. How's that going to work? Could they get COVID? What do I think about that? And then, um, Henry, and you'll be sensitive to this and what if they get COVID at school? Then we have to decide like, what. So I, I'm, you know, really feeling for the parents um, in Australia at the moment of having to hold these things and try and make sense of them, um, you know, at this kind of point in time. Mm. Um, Suji, how have you found it in, in in America the the impact of the mental health uh, side of it on children? Uh, I say that because what we've noticed in our school that that it appears to have been the most severe on the children who already have got uh, fragility or their families have issues with those things. And we've found getting the resources for that at times has been rather challenging. I think we're finding exactly the same, Henry. I think along the lines um, of what Sharon was sharing in terms of the kinds of issues that we're seeing presenting in our young um, you know, especially in our younger children, right? Um, some of the um, kind of uh, the issues around self-harm, you know, kind of the mental health and trauma issues that are presenting in our students. I think this is, you know, these are truly unprecedented times. And um, I think, you know, creating some unprecedented challenges for our students. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, we are seeing that, I think, like you said, Henry, we're seeing that our vulnerable populations are carrying the brunt of that. Um, you know, some of our families and communities mm -hmm. who don't necessarily have uh, the wealth of resources feeling um, more of that pressure. You know, as, as families are struggling, the students themselves are struggling. And then it's the additional burden of not having access to support, to the connection, to, you know, the peer connections um, and adult connections that you would make when you are physically in school, in the school environment. 
I think all the things that, you know, we teach our um, teachers uh, to sort of spot and detect, you know, in person in the classroom, kind of noticing and checking in on your students, a lot of that is much more challenging in that virtual space when you're not in a physical space with a child, when that time that you're with the child is limited and filtered through that virtual screen. And I think those are you know, sort of challenges that we're tackling right now to think about now, how do we do that better in that virtual space? Mm -hmm. I mean, moving on, Sharon, I, I, I do wanna commend you on a comment where you said, there is a resilience in many of the children that we often underestimate. And I know from experience that the moment the children come back on site, for the vast majority of them, the smiles are there. They seem to be more capable of moving on a little quicker than adults. It's not universal, but uh, they we, we can sometimes uh, impact our own feelings a little too much out of our love and protection for them. So it isn't all gloom with our children. They're they're often stronger yeah. than we think. Oh, absolutely, and I and you know I think. I think to Suzy's point, one of the things we were all a bit worried about and continue to be worried about is there was no eyes on children. And so for some families and for some children, that was really worrying for us. And if anything, I think it's highlighted the role of schools and not just, not that I mean, anyone who's been in a school knows this, but I think for, for the public to think about schools quite differently is not, well, that's the place where children do learning. It's actually that's the place where children um, develop emotionally and socially and their well-being is looked after and they do some learning as well and and I think there's you know we can have a longer conversation about this this opportunity for really rethinking or maybe re-talking about um, what schools actually mean in the lives of children and families and I, I think that's been one of the opportunities but to your point about um, resilience um, I was listening to an interview with John Stewart um, the other day and he brought up this really great point which is you know in um, in times we've had in the past, the depression, the war, out of that has come extraordinary resilience and extraordinary innovation and in, in, um, inventions and all sorts of amazing things have happened. And that's our children now. These children mm. that are in school now, they're going to be doing that. They're going to be coming up with all these extraordinary things. And that's not to underplay that some kids are doing it really tough because they are, and we shouldn't underplay that. But I, I do think there's going to be some extraordinary resilience and learnings out of this um, that we can't even imagine yet. Absolutely. Jordani, you are a member of the panel, so we're, we're, going, we're turning to you now. From your perspective, what has been the impact of COVID on schooling in Australia, the variable impact academic, e.g. NAP plan, disruption to school routines, pressures on families, et cetera, because you've done quite a bit of work in that space. Yeah, thanks, Henry. Um, and and just uh, a shout out to everything that um, Sharon and Suji have said before. I think they, they really um, have identified a number of really important issues there. Uh, Look, I think I think just picking up on on Sharon's point, the impacts have been really variable. I think that's what we are understanding better and better now. As some of the data starts to to trickle in, so you know we know that um, you know some some kids have coped um, and some schools have coped really well um, with these periods of remote learning. And and we do hear reports that some children actually find uh, the opportunity to learn remotely in their own time at home um, something that they actually prefer. Um, and certainly some schools have been positioned to, to pivot uh, very effectively to those periods of remote learning. And, and I just, you know, want to make the point that if you think about the scale of the, you know, business model or IT transformation that schools have experienced um, or experienced in February, March of 2020, uh, to, to shift from a face-to-face -face delivery model to a IT-based remote delivery model of schooling over such a large workforce and a, and a student base is really quite phenomenal. Um, and, uh, you know, some of those, some of those schools and, and school communities have managed to do a really tremendous job of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's other other children um, that haven't found that transition as, as easy. And I think, you know, we are going to see that through the academic uh, data that starts to trickle in. And so far, the, the picture has been a little bit mixed. Um, and, and I think Suji might um, be able to comment a little bit more on the experience in the mm. US. But in the Australian context, some of the initial uh, reports that came out of New South Wales uh, they ran a check-in assessment in October of last year after the seven or eight week lockdown for Sydney students. And that suggested that students had, I guess, lost learning or paused in their learning by you know, up to two to four months. 
um, and it was particularly tough uh, in their results for reading in those early years. I think what's interesting is when the NAPLAN data was released uh, a few mm. months ago, uh, those NAPLAN tests were conducted in May of this year, and they painted a, a bit of a different picture. So, so they suggested overall across Australia on average, learning hadn't actually taken too big a hit in literacy and numeracy. And I know a lot of us around the country, particularly uh, colleagues in Victoria, where children missed up to 20 weeks of learning, we really breathed a big sigh of relief. Um, mm -hmm. To see learning levels hold up on average that well in Victoria was, was quite remarkable. I think, you know, we have to have a sense of caution with that though. Um, you know, those averages don't show us uh, how individual students have fared. We certainly hear a lot of reports uh, that some students you know, it's not just a question of have they uh, been able to learn as much from their teachers um, in those online formats, but are they even kind of engaging in the lessons at all? Are they switching on the computer? Are they logging in? Is the screen turned on? Are they listening? Are they engaging with students? So there's some questions around disengagement there, I think that we're going to need to grapple with. And I think there's some issues for those early years children. So prep, preppies, grade one and grade two, they're still developing those foundational literacy and numeracy skills. And, you know, that's very difficult to deliver. It's not impossible, but it is very difficult to deliver in a remote learning format. And I think, you know, those, those little kids are, are gonna have had a, a pretty hard time and uh, schools are gonna have to think, I think really creatively about how they catch those, those little ones up. So I think that's sort of a, an academic uh, snapshot. It's a little bit of a, a watch this space um, and I think it's going to take us, you know, quite a while to really understand the impacts, not just last year, but also this year um, on student learning of these disruptions. Yeah, and, and just taking up your point there, Jordana, while we all were in Victoria pleasantly surprised with the NAPLAN results, um, and that, that was good to see, um, we shouldn't forget that in, the, in another breath, we often say that NAPLAN only paints a partial picture of students learning and most of the remote learning we did was very heavily focused on literacy and numeracy. So what's dropped off the areas that we don't evaluate is a question we need to ask ourselves, I would say. What do you say, Suji? You know, I think um, we, unlike I think it sounds like Australia, you know, we did not have our standardized assessments. And so those were canceled and so we, we are gonna be able to assess our students for the past two years. That's been a struggle for us. What we are finding in our more localized assessments um, is very much the same kind of finding, Jordana, that you are citing. So some of that, um, the gap in learning, um, some of this learning loss overall in, you know, a little bit higher for us, we're finding um, in general, uh, four to five months-ish. Again, um, all with a grain of salt, right? Very preliminary, um, but, I think just a particular concern is that, you know, it is a little bit more for our earlier grades, right? Especially in that kind of early literacy, the learning, those kind of building blocks of learning. Um, and then also that the um, kind of learning loss has been um, greater for, again, our, uh, you know, our vulnerable student population. So our students who are struggling prior, you know, our students with disabilities, our English learner students, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, our students in the foster, um, you know, in homeless systems, uh, our homeless and foster care um, youth. So I think that's something that we are trying to navigate now. And we're in this space of really thinking about how do we now that we are coming back, um, you know, really focus on supporting accelerated learning for our students. You know, we're calling like, how do we accelerate this learning? It's not about going back and catching up on every single standard or skill that was missed, but really focusing on what are those key cross-cutting concepts? What are the priority standards? How do we really build building bridges to on grade level content to catch those students up as quickly as possible and move them forward um, and not really, you know, focus too heavily on everything that was missed. I think that's kind of the space that we're in now. And, you know, I can't really hit enough too. I think um, both, um, you know, all of you said it, but, you know, our students are incredibly resilient, right? Anybody who has like, young children know this. Um, and I think really taking advantage of that, you know, students want to be back in class. They are, you know, thriving on 
um, you know, connecting with their fellow students, with their teachers and staff, and how do we really now maximize all of that to focus on providing our students what they need to, as quickly as possible, come out of uh, some of the deficits that we do know um, they've incurred. Uh, this is a question to all of you. When we started uh, here in, in Australia with uh, the remote learning, the huge emphasis, and I found this in my school, initially parents and, and, and the department officials very concerned about slippage of academic learning in children. And there was a lot of chatter around about how they're going to be a year or two lost years, uh, never to be regained. And But very very rapidly we morphed into a, we were almost more concerned about the well-being of the children. Uh, it, there was a real shift there. Uh, does that surprise surprise you people, uh, Sharon, Giordano, Suji? I mean, I'm happy to have a, a yep. crack at it. Look, I, I'm not surprised um, that we made that shift. I think, you know, once we, um, uh, you know, I think as Sharon said, you know, normally when we think about schools, the first thing we think about is academic learning. I mean, that is um, often understood to be the core purpose of schools. Um, but, you know, as soon as we have the children at home, uh, mums and dads rightly, um, first and foremost, are worried about their mental health and well-being. And I think that that message um, is one that was sort of received by by departments and, and our um, political leaders. And, and I think a lot of teachers were worried about the mental health and wellbeing of students as well. So, you know, I think that um, was certainly important. I think at the same time, we need to be um, really strategic in, we think, in how we think about bringing kids back to school and, and what we should prioritise going forward. I do think it'd be a mistake to focus on, on one aspect more than the other. So, you know, a lot of what we've talked about so far already is the importance of routines for children. And part of coming back into school and feeling safe in the school environment is re-establishing those learning routines um, and the behavioural expectations around what it means to be at school and how we engage with our peers and how we involve ourselves in learning. And learning can be very motivating for children as well. And it can be a, a really um, important way for children to, to have structure in their day and a sense of purpose and a sense of accomplishment so, you know, I think, I think looking forward, we need to find that, that sweet spot, I think, between uh, dividing our, our attention between those wellbeing issues, as well as the academic issues, and also understanding how they interact and can support each other going forward. Sharon, your opinion? Yeah, um, yeah we, we did a, um, a bit of a cheeky peek in the Medical Journal of Australia, um, where we looked sort of forward to 2030 and sort of looked forward and said, what did the world look like in 2030? And um, what had the pandemic done that had sort of done things differently? And, and in the education space, you know, we talked about this idea that schools were completely different places now, that they were, and, and, and this was a bit cheeky. So to take this um, um, within its context, which was, you know, schools were now focused on as much around children's learning as they were about well-being, and that we had a national assessment tool, which has got a terrible an acronym. We called it NARWIL, but it was the national, the national <laughs> assessment, the national assessment of health, well-being, and learning. And um, and I, and I, you know, and as I said, it was kind of going full. But I do think these um, incredibly societal disruptive moments are, are opportunities for us to stand back and go, you know, we talk about you know building it back better and all those sorts of things, but actually, could we build it back different? Is you know my question as well in that really understanding this, you know, um, complete nexus that we know with children being kind of integrated around their social emotional development and their cognitive development, all being the same person. And, and what an opportunity, um, and not that schools don't do this, but what an opportunity to be explicit about um, where we might go uh, going forward. And, and I say that knowing that that's not insubstantial a challenge um, and layering on top of that these equity issues that, that you um, uh, both um, Suji and Jana have already spoken about, which is we've got kids who are going to be further left behind um, because of the pandemic, and it isn't just about can we can we get them back up to being the same unequal we were before, or but can we actually um, look quite differently about the way we deliver um, education with a real equity uh, kind of focus? So it, that might be a bit Pollyanna-ish, but um, I, I think that's our opportunity. Mm. 
Sylvia, are we, are we experiencing uh, something you didn't experience in that regard? <laughs> Not at all. You know, I think um, I, you know, we're also using that same language around building back better, you know, talking about rethinking. And I, I think I think you're exactly right, Sharon, you know, um, in these unprecedented times, it's really creating a moment of true disruption. And I think the challenge for us right now as school um, kind of, you know, school systems across the world are to really think about whether or not we can actually take advantage of this opportunity now to really rethink the way that we're doing things um, to build better systems, to build better instructional um, resources and supports for our students and communities. And I don't, you know, I think there's a lot even to be learned from this moment in time. You know, I think we've spoken a lot about all the challenges that are of our students and school communities. Um, but I also want to point out that some of our students have actually thrived during this time. It's given mm -hmm. a space for our students to be able to focus in a different way, um, uh, to the pacing, um, you know, to access the learning in a different way. That's actually really worked for some of our students. Um, I think some of our schools and uh, you know, school communities and our educators have really taken this moment to really rethink the way that they are structuring lessons um, to engage our students in a different way. It's allowed them in this virtual space to be more explicit about the ways in which they are tapping into engaging with students, pulling them into the lessons and thinking about now, how do they take some of those lessons learned back into the online classroom? Um, as well as for schools to think about how might they actually now continue to use some of these virtual systems that they've developed to continue to provide supports for students who, um, you know, who may actually need that um, kind of, you know, uh, that sort of resource or support in order to um, learn the way that they need best. So I think there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of, um, I think, amazing innovations, a lot of, you know, lessons learned and best practices that we can actually take out of this moment as well. Mm. Just taking a, a step further, one of the things that we've certainly found as positive, we've, we've always prided ourselves on good relationships with our parents, and it's a triangular relationship for student learning, and everybody knows that if the three parts, the student, the parent, and the school are working cohesively together, it's in the best interest. Well, we've found through COVID that we've never known our parents better. I mean, there has been tension at times, but the relationship and the understandings and the knowledge between the home and the school, and I'd say respect overall, uh, has gone through the roof in many cases. Uh, Sharon, Jordana, so you, you, you had feedback on that? I mean, I, I think that's certainly uh, something that we hear from schools that we speak to as well. Um, you know, I think we're also hearing from some other schools that I, you know, going going back to the point that Sharon made earlier, um, you know, there are a lot of parents that are under a lot of stress as well in the homeschool mm. uh, context, and that that sometimes that stress is, um, you know, can be expressed in ways that that affect um, the relationship with the school. And I and I think that that is, um, you know, you can see why that happens. That that's something that is worrying. And I do, you know, I, I think we're all right to be concerned about the health and well being of. Of teachers and and educated mm. school personnel who mm. sometimes have found themselves on the receiving end of of that stress. Um, so you know, I do think that's something that um, you know principals need to be aware of and and policymakers need to be aware of as well to support teachers. Um, but where there have been those lessons learned, you know, I, I do I do hope that we are. Uh, can find the time to take pause and learn those because there are some forms of communication that have been really quite effective. I think. You know, I suspect we'll all, you know, hopefully 2022 is a lot, a lot smoother than 2021. But I, I think we can all think of a few things um, that we've we've really enjoyed about this year. And, and you know, I've got a, I've got three children myself, and there's been aspects of the communications with my school that I hope uh, continue into next year. So, you know, hopefully um, there is an opportunity to uh, sit down and learn those lessons, and you know, where those relationships with parents have worked well, um, that's a great base to build from. And where perhaps there have been challenges, you know, I, I think it's uh, really important that there's an opportunity to, to reset and, and listen um, to each other and, and sort of have that empathy with each other and, and try to put those relationships on a, on a better footing uh, going into next year. 
because you know the reality is as, as we've said you know these experiences have been really different for different people and, and certainly there's a lot of uh, parents out there that have, have found it quite quite challenging as well as the kids. Yeah. Sharon did you want to comment? I need to say just again just some of the interesting things that have happened um, as a result of this for example the tutoring program um, so so what's really interesting and um, Jordan will be much more familiar with the evidence behind tutoring than I am but there's pretty good evidence and there always has been pretty good evidence behind tutoring so so what's really fascinating is a few things um, so first of all this you know this is kind of a, this it's a response in the UK as well which is really interesting but um, so this idea of providing tutoring programs for kids who may be at risk of having learning um, either losses or what, however you want to kind of frame it, like, wow, back theoretically, do, why didn't we do this like years ago, right? Um, and so, wow, now we're actually going, this is an evidence-based, and as someone who loves evidence, this is an evidence-based intervention that we can actually implement in schools that may actually be really fantastic for a whole group of kids. And I've been thinking about, wow, wouldn't it be great if they could actually provide a bit of mental health support for these kids as well, because they're doing it like, wouldn't it be great to be innovative in that space? And what's really interesting about the tutoring, and I think what's going to um, emerge out of our results, and this is, I, I'm a bit anxious about looking underneath the hood of the NAPLAN results, to be honest, because um, I think the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. So I think there's a whole bunch of kids who actually probably got tutoring at home, from their parents right so they're sitting at home with their parents getting a lot of one-on-one -on -one and they're going to be going like this and there'll be a bunch of a bunch of kids who for whom that wasn't possible for a whole range of things um they didn't have access to um, digital um tools their parents couldn't spend time with them language differences all sorts of things you can imagine and i think they're going to go so i think we've kind of been like this we've had like these kind of tram track inequalities i'm worried we're going to be like this um so i'm a bit anxious about our NAPLAN results but i do think things like tutoring at a scale um, might be one of those fabulous things that keep going and really start innovating the way that we deliver um, education. Now I've got a question here which relates to really the direction we're taking from Jura Browers. Uh, Jura appreciates the equity lens through which we're, we're, we're conducting the seminar um, and we've spent a bit of time talking about the mental and emotional health in children. Would we be able to reflect on the physical well-being of children and the potentially reduced movement skill development of young children due to missing out on phys ed classes? And uh, overseas publications have reported this reduction as a result of much shorter lockdowns. Who would like to take that up first? I'll kick it off and then, you know, please feel free. I think, um, yeah, I think that was one of the concerns as well, um, you know, in uh, especially in the early days of our uh, kind of, um, you know, stay at home order when all of our students went offline and um, it was just, you know, they were sitting in front of screens all day and we weren't quite sure how to proceed and you're we afraid to go outside, um, you know, and many of our students, um, again, when you think about that sort of disparity, uh, kind of, um, you know, vector, right, I think not all of our students have backyards they can run out into or parks they can access easily, right, and so I think, you know, we did we did start to see that. We did start to see some early reports um, as um, we looked at some of the obesity rates of our students rising in some of our communities and what that meant. Um, I think we've, you know, we at the CCE and our work with schools and districts really tried to focus on, okay, what are the, what are some of the resources and tools and tips we can give, you know, to um, our schools and districts as they're thinking about creating structures and schedules for their day. So that, that is part of the you know, online virtual day, just as it would be in the in-classroom day. Um, I think I wanna come back to a point that we've all been making as well, is that during this time, what we've learned is, you know, our parents have actually become part of our learning, um, kind of our learning staff with us. And so how do we equip them with the tools um, so that it's not, you know, just spending some time with your child, you know, when you have a moment in between Zoom meetings, but I'm um, taking that outside, taking walks together. You know, how do we really create learning moments of both um, to exercise, again, like mental well being, physical well being, as we really focus on, you know, learning well being as well? Yeah, look, I, I think Jura has raised a good point because even before COVID, and we really haven't had much choice about having to go online because that's 
the only way we could connect. And I think some of that's been in, in, very beneficial for teachers learning and for engaging the kids. But the, the, the issue of how much time children spend on screens pre-COVID had already become an issue uh, for a lot of families. I'd heard from many parents over time, I can't get my kid off uh, a screen. They're on there all the time at night. And um, how many more hours do we want them to do that now? It is a good question to ask in terms of balance. And I think, I think uh, the remote learning time kids have now spent on computers is perhaps a good time to say that when we move post-COVID uh, in embracing ICT, to what extent do we incorporate that in the daily program of children, bearing in mind that issue? Jordana, you might like to comment on that. Look, I yeah. I, look, I think it's a really um, it's a really interesting one. Every now and then, you read reports overseas of uh, countries that, in, in the effort to find more instructional time, they're shortening lunch breaks and and recess breaks and and reducing sports periods. I mean, I think we would all agree that that is not not the way to go. Um, our kids need as much time as possible, you know, out there playing with their friends, re-establishing those social routines moving their bodies. Uh, for those of us who have endured those long lockdowns uh, in Melbourne in particular, you know, we've been living with a with a five kilometre radius. Um, it's been hard to get out of the house and, and get to the playgrounds. Uh, it's been hard to even, you know, go for a walk sometimes. So um, we need to be doing as much physical activity as possible. And, you know, I think understanding that that, that is uh, a support for, um, for learning and, and resilience and emotional kind of well-being going forward. So uh, in terms of the screen time, I think, you know, looking forward, I think uh, in some ways schools perhaps have broken through some of those uh, barriers around how to integrate technology into learning. There's been a real, uh, just through sheer necessity, I, I think there's been a lot of IT skills gained and a lot of innovation in that space. So I would imagine that, you um, you know, we do see um, increased use of ICT in schools going forward, but I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where kids, you know, in, in those early years of school um, don't have the opportunity to sit down on the ground and, and work with um, concrete materials when they're developing number sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we still want to see those kids up, you know, acting in drama classes and learning those physical and motor skills. And, you know, that's one area where I'm pretty confident that Australia is a, a fairly proud sporting nation. We'll make sure we, we don't lose sight of, of those important parts of learning. Suji, how's that affected you guys over there in uh, sunny California, is it? <laughs> you know, I... Yes, I think we're, you know, we're also grappling with those same challenges, frankly. I think, you know, our governor um, announced the initiative to open up the kind of state parks um, as a, a tool to get uh, students and parents outside. And, um, you know, and I, again, as, you know, same as I think Jordana was talking about, you know, as we're coming back into um, the school classrooms to really Again, yeah, take this opportunity to rethink and restructure potentially the school day. We're having to do that anyhow um, because we're looking at physical distancing and spacing and classroom environments. And as we're doing that, you know, trying to really encourage school and district team to think about then not just rethinking the physical environment that our students are coming back into, but the ways in which they are interacting with each other, with the learning, how might there be more emotion involved? How do we um, really rethink schedules um, differently? How do we think about learning differently? I, again, I just want to come back to like, this moment in time when I think all of these you know, all of these questions, these um, these issues that are being raised, the challenges that we're facing really create these opportunities to think about um, learning in a different way. I think we've talked about tutoring, um, you know, at the course of this evening, I see a question in there about, you know, tutoring as well. It's, 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 um, it's been interesting to really see, I don't know, Jordana, about you, but to see that this real focus on tutoring, the, you know, the research coming out, the evidence-based approaches to really, uh, the impact that high impact, you know, high quality tutoring can have on accelerating learning, on supporting um, to those, uh, kind of addressing learning loss, but also in um, addressing some of those 
I think mental health and socio-emotional learning challenges, you know, those are connections that we are making, you know, with that one-on-one -on -one tutor or that small group and learning space. Um, you know, I think really thinking holistically about what is it, how are we supporting student well-being? And it's not just about learning, it's not just about, you know, physical safety, that it, it is all really braided together about, you know. Um, what is the well-being of a child? Um, you know, what is our role as educators in that space? Um, and how do we really create that environment physically, emotionally, and academically to help every student thrive? Now, you you mentioned um, it's time we started looking forward. We've we've um, we've explored the recent past very uh, very deeply, and we've 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 gleaned a lot out of that. And you've mentioned a couple of you have mentioned the tutor learning program, which we do have in Victoria, and it will continue next year. And I know you're doing some valuable research in that area, Jordana. Um, and and we've chatted about this off air. It hasn't worked this year in the way that it was meant to because assumptions were made about where we would be with COVID. So schools have been partially using it. Uh, in moving forward next year, let's assume a, a slightly brighter world and we can get that program up and running. There have been so many different models applied across so many different schools. Um, what should we be looking for in moving forward with that tutor learning initiative program? Thanks, Henry. Look, I think the tutoring program is a really exciting initiative in Victoria and in New South Wales. We are, uh, Grattan obviously did a lot of research on the evidence base around uh, tutoring, small group tutoring as an effective catch up strategy last year. We published a, a big report on that and uh, we were very excited last year that New South Wales and Victoria invested really, really large amounts of money. So in Victoria, I think it was around 250 million last year and a little over 300 million in New South Wales last year in tutoring. Uh, and both of those programs will be extended for 2022, which is really exciting. Uh, they're designed to reach a very large number of students. So in the Victorian context, it's about 200,000 students. Uh, will be reached through that program and in New South Wales around 290,000 students. Um, I, I think you know the international evidence base is strong. Um, we don't have as much evidence in Australia yet about the effectiveness of tutoring. We can expect it to be very effective in Australia but it will be great to see the evaluation evidence of how uh, we can you know, really maximise the return on that investment in the Australian context and what programs have worked really well. So this is you know, a, a, a tremendous investment really in a strategy that not only could, could help us tackle those widening gaps, I guess, that we're worried about opening up in the context of the pandemic, but really could be used to tackle those existing gaps that we see opening up uh, with students in the future. So we already know, for example, that you know, students in year nine uh, with parents who are less well educated tend to be around three years behind uh, students with, with the highest educated parents. So we already have this big gap um, already uh, on average, um, and we do need to be trying to understand as best how we can tackle that. And, and small group tutoring could be a really important part of that package. The things that we need to think about just like everything else, um, the, the magic is not necessarily in the ratio, a one-to-one -one relationship or, you know, a small number of students working with a, with a tutor. That does matter, but the real magic is in the quality teaching, just like it is in that whole class setting. So we need to make sure that our tutors are, are really well trained and really well supported to provide that quality tutoring experience in that small group setting. Um, the dosage matters. So the international evidence would suggest that, you know, you want to be uh, keeping the, the tutoring sessions um, up to sort of three to five times a week. They can be quite short. So 20 minutes might be enough in those lower year levels if it's really highly targeted, but, you know, it doesn't need to be more than 45 minutes at a time. And the program should be extending, you know, potentially up to 20 weeks. So, you know, it needs to be a, a well-designed uh, tutoring intervention delivered by tutors who are well-trained and supported um, in that small group setting with that dosage, um, you know, keeping that dosage high. And obviously attendance is really important and establishing that relationship with the tutor is important. So 
in some ways it's not rocket science you know those factors matter in the classroom as well um, but you know getting those right in the in the tutoring context I think will be the key to success and we are really excited about seeing some you know robust evaluation uh, efforts because we know you know like everything in education some things will work better than others um, but what a tremendous opportunity we have before us now to really understand how to deliver this as effectively as possible to support Australian students into the future. Yes now we've got time on the wing and we've got a number of very interesting questions so we'll try and answer them a little more briefly. Uh, a question for you and it's a good one I think Sharon um, in terms of communication uh, it uh, is the DET, which is the Department of Education and Training in Victoria. It's a question from Cathy. Bringing in mental health support in schools for Victoria, will there be a need for extra mental health training for teachers from your perspective? Yes, yeah, so I think um, a lot of this stuff was being thought about, interestingly, before the pandemic because mm. we were just really worried about um, kids' mental health. So a few things, and, and, it's, and it's also been amplified by the Royal Commission into Mental Health Care um, as well. So, and, and that's obviously pre pandemic as well. So, a few things. There's certainly some money being shifted into the department for some immediate mental health support, um, a la psychologists, et cetera, to support schools where there are difficulties. Um, anyone who has got a child or who's trying to get hold of a psychologist will know at the moment that is no easy feat to find psychologists. Hence, why I was suggesting maybe the tutors having some mental health um, support for kids might be quite useful. Um, the second thing is there's a program at the moment that's actually coming out through our centre called the Mental Health in Primary Schools, which is improving mental health literacy in teachers. So it's not trying to turn teachers into being um, mental health professionals, but it is giving teachers a language around mental health and an opportunity to think about how they might um, review and think about the child before them within a kind of mental health context. You know, are they coping? Are they struggling? Are they thriving? You know, that sort of language. So that's all happening at the moment within um, DET and for which there is um, funding to do so. But I think, in the, and I think the point of this question is that, you know, this is an opportunity and whether we call it mental health or wellbeing or social emotional development, I guess that's a, um, a good question. Um, regardless of that, I think there is this opportunity now to think much more about how we integrate mental health into the language of education, but not necessarily ask teachers to do everything and everything and everything, because I think I think that will just um, not be where we want to go, and I think that would be unfair. So giving teachers a language around mental health and an, a sense of who are the kids I should be worried about, tick, expecting them to do everything for those kids, that's not possible. So what is? how do you build the infrastructure out in a school? Um, in the same way that you've got tutoring, how do you build the infrastructure out that helps the school intersect with the rest of the healthcare system, build the infrastructure and maybe multidisciplinary support it needs itself to be able to support the needs of kids? And how do you do that? You know, we've been very taken with response to intervention. How do you do that in a way that works out what do all kids need and what do some kids need and then what do very few kids need but might need it more, more intensively? And I think that sort of thinking, um, which, was, which has been published well before the pandemic, but as I think this opportunity to go forward and tutoring sits in that tier two kind of bucket of stuff, um, okay. that's the opportunity. Yeah. Sharon, just taking uh, the question of her further, uh, Mary Clark's asking you a question. If the cause of mental health issues for students is their parents who are struggling for co with COVID-induced anxiety, should more of a focus be on the parents? Well, it's probably not all. It's probably and. Um, so I think we definitely need to think about the kids themselves and, and in particular as they come into school, you know, like anyone, I mean, you would have experienced this yourself, Henry, when the kids come back. It's just kind of like it's a bit weird when they come back. It's like they've forgotten how to interact with each other. So there is... God. God. That kind of moment as they're coming back. You know, parents lost their jobs. Um, they don't have income anymore. Um, and let me uh, let me know if you can still hear me. Yes, um, they don't have income anymore. Um, so I, I do think we need to be very conscious of the needs of parents at the moment and what we're doing uh, to support them and um, and to be very mindful of that. But to your point, Henry, this idea of schools then partnering much more strongly with parents and what's come out of it, like yay, and what we can do to potentially. Um, keep that going but again it can't all be the school but can the school be the gateway for which these other connections 
um, occur. And and exactly to, to Mary's question is what can what can schools do to connect parents um, potentially to other services that might help them? Because absolutely, if a parent's feeling better about themselves, if you know their sort of the stress of everything that's to do with COVID, um, they'd be able to deal with that. Then that will be much better for their kids for sure. Uh, Jordana, as we're getting towards the end, um, a question for you. As students return to schools in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, what should the priorities be for governments, schools, teachers and families? Thanks, Henry. I'll keep it, I'll keep it snappy as we're, we're almost at, at time. Um, look, I think that the first thing, first and foremost, is you know, working with the health department to uh, get all those public health measures in place to reduce the likelihood of outbreaks in schools. So you know, we really want to keep those uh, COVID-related disruptions in schools to an absolute minimum, not just because uh, we don't want more COVID spreading in, in schools or in the community, but also we're, we're mindful that uh, you know, outbreaks are likely to lead to disruptions and that's going to be, you know, a headache for, for parents and children and teachers and school leaders themselves. So the public health side of things is going to have to be a, a top priority. Uh, those, those pieces around just the successful reintegration of students into the learning environment are critical. So, you know, settling kids back into those routines uh, will be really essential and, and also allowing children the opportunity for some fun, uh, reconnecting with their friends and enjoying some of those milestone moments that uh, we weren't sure they were going to get as we reached the end of the year. Um, and then I think the third piece, you know, is really around that student assessment. It's really important that we do check in with kids academically. We work out, out where they're at so we can move to that tiered intervention model. Um, and we, we do that check in on academic issues and also on the wellbeing and, and the mental health issues as well. And then just think about our plan for 2022. You know, 2022 is a new year. I think we can uh, all expect that it's going to take um, a good couple of years to work through uh, the consequences of the last two years um, on the learning front and on the social and emotional wellbeing front. Um, and schools will need to spend some time thinking about a plan going, going forward. So, you know, I think they're the, the top priorities. And, um, you know, I just tip my hat to all the teachers and the school leaders out there doing the hard work day in, day out uh, with the kids and, and helping them get back on track. It's a tremendous uh, job, a tremendous effort. And I think, you know, we are really indebted to them for that work that they're doing. Susie, in a couple of words, it's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, what are your words of wisdom in moving forward? Because we, we are a little behind where you are. What's your best advice for Australian uh, communities, governments, teachers, parents? Yeah, I don't know if I have words of wisdom. I think, you know, what I can say is that we're truly all in this together, I think. You know, through the course of having these conversations and you know, pre-checking in with Jordana, I think it was it was um, both interesting but heartening to know really that the conversations and the struggles and the challenges, but also the insights and the areas of strength and kind of focus on resiliency that we're seeing in the U.S. and California are also being mirrored there. I think maybe my closing thought would be something that we're really focusing on here in California is this investment that we are, you know, I think we've been, we're moving forward with this incredible investment in community schools, um, which is, I think, really speaks to everything that we've been talking about today, right? The fact that our schools, Sharon's point, have been the kind of locus of support and structure, not just academically, but connecting with our health services, you know, being that communication space, um, talking and filtering policy through to our parents and communities, connecting on the social services. Now, as we think about academic supports and um, mental health and well-being supports, I think I, I see some questions even about technology supports, you know, for our under-resourced communities and schools. Um, you know, how do we really now create the infrastructure for our schools and the supports for them to do that right? I think across everything that we're talking about, whether it's new ideas, like not new, but, you know, new focuses, you, you know, like, you know, high dosage tutoring or thinking about learning acceleration, whatever it is, we really need to make sure that there is the infrastructure to support it, the support for our schools and especially our teachers to really, you know, um, to be able to implement it in the classrooms and support that. They are our front line, as Jordana says, and I think that's going to be our number one focus as well, making sure that our teachers stepping in have everything they need to be successful, um, not just for themselves, but their students. Uh, Sharon, did you want to have a quick final word? We're nearing the end. 
just not not really anything quick. I just want to just reiterate and, um, you know, Jordana's point about the teachers and the um, educationalists across, and I do want to say across schools and early childhood education and care, a big shout out to the education and care sector as well, who often get left out of these conversations. They have been doing an extraordinary job. Remember when we were remote learning the kids, they were actually still doing face-to-face. -face. So um, I just want to put a shout out to um, all of those frontline staff um, who have just been managing extraordinary pivoting um, mm. and um, and also to the parents who um, I think have been doing it tough too. Yeah, I, I, I reiterate those words and I know, look, there's things we could do better, there's things we do different, but I do know that the people in my profession, they have a good heart uh, and, and they work for the best interest of the kids and right across the system, I think um, there's been a, a genuine effort to do the best and I'm sure as we move forward, uh, that will continue. Jordana, would you like to um, have the honour of closing closing remarks? Thanks, Henry. Uh, thank you for guiding us through the discussion today. And thank you, Sharon and Suji, for sharing your incredible expertise and wisdom with us. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and to the audience, thank you for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. Grattan staff from across the Institute have spent a lot of time thinking about how Australia can best respond to the unprecedented challenges of the last couple of years, uh, including how to support schools and children. In the education program, as I've mentioned already, this included our 2020 research report on COVID catch up, which was a key driver of over half a billion dollars of investment in catch up tutoring programs in New South Wales and Victoria this year alone. We are really thrilled to see that those programs will be renewed next year. If you appreciate our independent research and advocacy and you'd like to see more of it, please consider donating to the Grattan Institute. Your donations make a tremendous difference to the scope of research that we can do. We're very grateful to all of our supporters. Thank you again. Stay safe and have a wonderful afternoon.